Dr. Ravi Shankar is the chair of the University of Arizona Food Safety Consortium and an AFTO-approved food process authority at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Her lab offers food testing services for the local and national food companies, including sanitizer manufacturers, and her research focuses on various aspects of food safety. Dr. Ravi Shankar has published over 70 manuscripts in peer-reviewed international scientific journals, and her research has been featured in various mass media outlets. She has been the recipient of the 2022 ACBS Outstanding Faculty and Teaching Award, 2021 Inventor of the Year Award by the Tech Launch Arizona, 2022 Lifetime Achievement Award by the Indian Association of Applied Microbiologists, the Minjang Scholar Scientist of the Fujian Agriculture and Forestry University Award 2019 to present, and the 2015 and 2016 ACBS Outstanding Faculty in Research Award. She teaches food microbiology and biotechnology lecture and laboratory courses for graduate and undergraduate students at the University of Arizona. And yeah, thank you for joining us, Dr. Ravi Shankar. Feel free to share your screen and just take over from here. Yeah, I will. Yeah, are you able to see my screen? Hopefully. Yes, uh, we can see it. Okay, I'm going to try to get to the slideshow mode in just a second. Okay, are you able to see my screen now? It looks good. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you for the um, nice introduction. And before I begin, um, I would like to thank uh, the organizers um, and specifically uh, Shana Oliveira uh, for this uh, opportunity to discuss uh, some of my food safety research with you. I'm a faculty member at the School of Animal and Comparative Biomedical Sciences. And um, my lab focuses on two major aspects when it comes to food safety. One is uh, we try to understand uh, the survival strategies of foodborne pathogenic bacteria in uh, food production as well as processing environments. And uh, second, um, we are looking at natural ways to control these foodborne uh, pathogens um, in different types of foods. So um, today's lecture will basically focus on these various topics. Um, Initially, I will give you an introduction on foodborne illnesses as well as foodborne bacteria. I wasn't sure um, what the you know food safety knowledge level of the audience will be, but uh, you know, looking at the questions uh, that were um, uh, on the screen, it looks like more than fifty percent of the audience have uh, a food safety background. So, for many of you, the introduction may be a little bit of a uh, refresher. For the others, it may be useful. Um, then um, I'll move on to talking about um, what are some of the emerging threats, what are the challenges, how these foodborne bacteria are able to survive in food production as well as uh, processing environments. And I will give you some examples of research we have done in our lab uh, with regard to these survival strategies. Um, then I'll move on to um, talking about uh, cross-contamination, both uh, in the pre as well as post-harvest type of uh, uh, environments and uh, you know why uh, preventing cross-contamination is important. Then um, I'll also talk to you about some of the control measures um, uh, in uh, to uh, reduce foodborne illnesses. And I'll give again give you some examples of the research we have done with regard to these control measures. And then finally, I will leave you with um, a few summary points and also some uh, general conclusions from uh, whatever we have discussed, uh, you know, so far in this uh, presentation. So as you all know, uh, foodborne illnesses are clearly a public health uh, problem. Uh, 
And uh, uh, every year we have people getting sick from consuming contaminated food and uh, the contamination agents can vary. Um, and uh, uh, in the United States every year, we have about 48 million people that get uh, sick about 128,000 people that are hospitalized and about 3,000 people that die from consuming contaminated food products. And uh, overall, foodborne illnesses turn out to be really expensive because the annual costs of foodborne illnesses are more than $35 billion. And uh, the entire society is involved in foodborne illnesses because we have uh, the industry uh, who may have, you know, a problem either in their food processing plant or in their production environment and so on. Uh, we have health services being involved um, and we have uh, regulatory agencies being involved because they need to figure out what happened, what caused the outbreak and uh, also people who get sick, the victims of foodborne illnesses. So there, there is you know, a lot involved in, a, in when, when uh, these foodborne outbreaks occur for the industry, they may have to recall the product. For uh, the victims, they may not be able to go to work. Uh, so there is lost wages. They may have to seek medical uh, uh, attention. So they'll, they, they probably end up going to the hospital and there are medical costs involved. And for the <coughs> regulatory agencies, they have to form a team and uh, they need to investigate the outbreak. So there are costs involved, you know, in different sectors of the society. So it turns out to be really expensive. So it is definitely um, important to try and reduce these foodborne illness outbreaks as much as uh, possible. So there are various agents uh, that cause these foodborne illness outbreaks. And the top agents are given in this particular table. So we have foodborne bacteria, we have parasites, as well as viruses causing these outbreaks. And if you look at this particular column, if you look at the percentage of illnesses, foodborne viruses top the list. They cause about 59% of the illnesses and bacteria cause about 39% of the foodborne illnesses. However, if you look at the percent of hospitalizations as well as percent of a uh, percentage of deaths bacteria top the list 64% of the hospitalizations as well as deaths are caused by bacteria so the take home message from this table is that the most serious outcomes as well as fatal outcomes are mainly caused by foodborne bacterial type of agents and now that we have seen that bacteria cause the most serious uh, um, uh, outcomes with regard to foodborne illnesses, uh, here I'm giving you the list of foodborne pathogenic bacteria that have been involved in foodborne illness um, outbreaks. And um, the ones that you're seeing in red font are uh, Escritia coli 015787, Salmonella enterica, Listeria monocytogenes, and Campylobacter jejuni are the top in the list. They keep causing outbreaks. Uh, every year you will see outbreaks caused by these uh, foodborne pathogenic bacteria. And these are the four that we have been uh, uh, doing, conducting research in our lab with. So, and I will be giving you some examples of those, you know, uh, research. So, um, uh, the four foodborne uh, pathogenic bacteria, the top top ones, I would like to give you a little bit of an introduction of these foodborne bacterial agents. The first one here is Escherichia coli 015787. And I'm sure all of you have heard about uh, this particular bacterium associated with outbreaks in romaine lettuce in the past uh, a few years, starting 2018, every year this bacterium has caused foodborne outbreaks uh, with the romaine lettuce in the various growing regions. And um, this particular pathogen um, was highly associated um, with the uh, uh, ground beef type of products. Uh, in 1980, is, it emerged as a pathogen of concern in ground beef type of products. And uh, there were a number of outbreaks as well as uh, 
uh, recalls, but in the 2000s, uh, this pathogen emerged as, a, as one of concern in fresh produce as well. Uh, the pathogen is highly associated with the gut of animals, and specifically in uh, uh, harvest facilities, what happens is um, it's present in the gut and uh, uh, when the you know animals are uh, harvested, uh, uh, there are the carcasses are dehydrated, and then the gut contents of the animals are removed by a process called as evisceration under high pressure. And what happens is um, from the gut, the organism ends up contaminating the carcasses. And uh, when ground beef is made, many different you know animals, uh, their parts are put into the grinder and the ground beef is made. So even if one animal has E. coli 015787, the entire batch of ground beef can end up getting contaminated. So ground beef is one of the food products uh, that this uh, pathogen is highly associated with. And uh, then, you know, produce I already talked about. Uh, in 2006, there was a big outbreak in uh, spinach. And then, you know, since then, there have been a number of outbreaks uh, happening in uh, fresh produce. And um, one of the characteristic features of this organism that um, is of concern to food processor, processors is the acid the tolerance of the organism and uh, the organism uh, you know this organism has caused a number of outbreaks in fruit juices specifically you know apple cider um, uh, there was uh, a mandation because of a number of outbreaks there was a mandation that uh, the uh, apple ciders need to be pasteurized before you know they are consumed and before they are sold in the retail and uh, the organism causes uh, normal gastrointestinal type of symptoms such as you know vomiting headache you know diarrhea fever and uh, it also causes uh, dysentery which means the patient will end up having blood and the diarrhea and um, the organism produces uh, sugar toxins and these toxins they migrate from the uh, intestines to the kidney and they impair the function of the kidneys causing a condition called as hemolytic uremic syndrome. So, and this is very commonly uh, seen in very young children as well as among the elderly. It can be a big problem. And many young children have died in uh, some of the outbreaks uh, that have occurred with E. coli 015787. And uh, so it can be uh, uh, pretty dangerous for this sector of the population. And uh, we definitely need to control you know, outbreaks uh, occurring uh, with E. coli 015. The next one is Listeria monocytogenes, and this bacterium is one of the most deadly when it comes to foodborne pathogens. The number of cases caused by Listeria monocytogenes are really, really small, but the percentage of uh, uh, fatalities occurring because of this pathogen can be very, very high. And in the 80s, listeria was a big problem in dairy products. So it has, you know, caused a number of outbreaks with cheeses, also, you know, different types of milk products. And uh, then, you know, we also had outbreaks in coleslaw uh, because, you know, the cabbage that was grown was fertilized uh, with manure that had the uh, uh, listeria and uh, uh, the listeria ended up uh, in the coleslaw. And then in the 1990s, so in the 80s, there were a number of outbreaks in dairy products. The dairy industry came up with stringent, stringent measures to control listeria in these products. But then in the 1990s, listeria emerged as a pathogen of concern in ready-to-eat meat products. And it still continues to cause problems in ready-to-eat meat products. Um, and uh, listeria has also uh, been a pathogen of concern in melons in, you know, 20 10 there was an uh, outbreak uh, where melons were implicated. Um, and some of the characteristic features of listeria that are of concern to food processors are um, its psychotropic nature. Um, listeria is able to grow, although slowly, at refrigeration temperatures. So for some of the products such as ready to eat meats, it could be a big problem because there could be surface contamination. And um, when consumers buy these products, they may be storing them in the refrigerator. 
and they may be eating slowly and if listeria is present or if it causes contaminates from uh, other items in the refrigerator then listeria can start growing slowly at a, at, a, uh, at refrigeration temperatures and it can grow to levels dangerous specifically for some of the at risk population and listeria is very hardy in the environment if you are going to be you know sampling refrigerators in consumer homes if you are sampling sinks you may be able to find listeria monocytogenes it's you know it survives really well in the environment and another concern when it comes to listeria monocytogenes it's uh, is its ability to form biofilms so if listeria forms biofilms in equipment surfaces if it gets into a processing plant by industry is very very concerned they want to keep listeria as much as possible out of their processing plants because once it gets into the processing plants it is really difficult to eradicate it so there are you know surveillance program environmental monitoring pro programs by the food industry and they try to keep listeria out of their processing facilities as much as possible and some of the symptoms with regard to listeria monocytogenes it does cause normal flu like symptoms uh, and also other symptoms uh, gastrointestinal symptoms such as vomiting diarrhea headaches and so on and so forth uh, but uh, with at risk, at risk individuals it can cause some serious symptoms uh, specifically listeria is uh, very dangerous to pregnant women and depending on the trimester listeria can cause uh, abortion it can cause uh, stillbirths and it can it is one of the pathogens that can cross uh, the placental barrier and it can affect the unborn fetus and um, it can cause um, uh, meningitis uh, encephalitis uh, and uh, that, that that's why you can end up having you know still births um, and the other at risk population are immunocompromised individuals people who have other types of ailments cancer patients hiv positive individuals for them uh, 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 listeria can be really dangerous and it can cause um, it uh, meningitis uh, encephalitis and sepsis and so on and so forth for normal healthy individuals it causes a condition called as febrile gastroenteritis so people can have flu like symptoms but that they will recover but for at risk individuals uh, uh, listeria can be pretty deadly and that's why we see a number of you know fatalities in many of the outbreaks the next one here is uh, campylobacter jejuni and campylobacter uh, uh, take, you know competes with the the other foodborne pathogen salmonella in becoming the leading uh, cause of diarrhea in the 1990s campylobacter was the leading cause of diarrhea but in the 2000s list, you know, salmonella has taken that place of becoming be, being the leading cause of diarrhea uh, campylobacter just like e coli over 57h7 is associated with the gut of animals Campy is associated with the gut of birds. So Campylobacter is uh, uh, mainly found in many of the you know, ground poultry uh, 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 products and so on and so forth. And again, in the harvest facilities, when uh, the birds are, are harvested and uh, the gut contents are removed uh, by uh, the process of evisceration, uh, the uh, carcasses can end up getting contaminated and, you know, ground uh, poultry type of products can end up having Campylobacter jejuni. And this path pathogen is also associated with other um, animal uh, type of products such as, you know, ground beef, ground pork. Um, and uh, because of uh, you know con uh, being uh, present in contamin in in water uh, and the water contaminating other types of uh, you know food products, you can end up having a, a, a Campylobacter in raw milk as well as in salad vegetables as well. Uh, and uh, with Campylobacter, um, it uh, does cause um, normal gastrointestinal type of symptoms such as uh, vomiting, diarrhea, and fever. But there are a couple of sequelae that Campylobacter is uh, highly associated with. And one of the sequelae is Guillain-Barré syndrome. And uh, this is basically neuromuscular 
paralysis. And there is an association that at least, you know, 40% of the patients that have the Guillain-Barre syndrome have had Campylobacter infection in the past. And the other sequelae is Reiter's syndrome. And Reiter's syndrome is basically uh, reactive arthritis where patients can have pain in the joints, specifically knee joints. And there is again an association of these patients having a Campylobacter infection in the past. The next pathogen is Salmonella enterica. And Salmonella has a uh, 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 has uh, been involved in outbreaks in many, many different types of food products. If you take uh, uh, meat products, uh, eggs, poultry, uh, salmonella was initially a big problem in the 60s and 70s and so on with egg products as well as poultry. But then, you know, salmonella emerged as a pathogen of concern in other types of food products produce. Uh, salmonella has caused uh, problems in tree nuts, uh, many of the, you know, dry products such as, you know, chocolates, uh, peanut butter in the 1990s, salmonella caused problems in peanut butter, um, also, um, you know, other produce like tomatoes, uh, sprouts, uh, leafy greens, peppers, meat and dairy products. So you name it, any type of food product salmonella would have caused outbreaks in. And one of the characteristic feature of salmonella that is of concern to food pro pro processors is its uh, desiccation tolerance. So salmonella is pretty resistant to dry environments and that's what the big problem with you know, peanut butter outbreak was. So this particular facility in Georgia had a bird a fecal material on their rooftop. And uh, salmonella survived. The, the bird fecal material was probably dry. And uh, one day there was a huge uh, downpour of rainfall. And then the, the fecal material that was present on the rooftop, you know, salmonella was present in there and uh, it got, you know, rehydrated. And uh, what happened was uh, there was a microscopic, uh, 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 there was a microscopic, you know, a pour on the a rooftop, and then uh, there was a huge vat of peanut butter that was churning in there. Salmonella present in the fecal material started dripping from that microscopic, you know, leak in the roof, and it ended up contaminating uh, the entire vat of peanut butter. So that's you know one of the sad stories about salmonella contamination, and um, salmonella causes uh, normal gastrointestinal symptoms uh, such as you know vomiting, diarrhea, chills, and fever. Uh, but many of the uh, uh, people who have individuals who have salmonella, uh, even after their symptoms subside, they can be asymptomatic carriers and they can be spreading salmonella in the environment. And salmonella is also very hardy in the environment, just like Listeria, and it can survive uh, because of, again, the desiccation tolerance, it can survive for very long periods of time. So that's uh, the you know introduction about foodborne pathogens. Uh, now that we have seen how serious or how deadly some of these foodborne pathogens are, I'm going to tell you why it is important, why research is important to understand the survival as well as why do we need to uh, research all these control strategies. So the, if you look at current consumers, so in you know traditionally thermal processing was used and we were able to kill the bacteria present in food products and that was not a big problem. But uh, uh, the current consumers, uh, there is a big change in their preferences. The current consumers want fresh like tasting foods with, with very good nutritional quality. They want convenient packaging. And uh, at the same time, they want safe uh, food products. And to meet the consumer preferences, the food industry is uh, moving away from traditional thermal processing. And they are, they, they are trying novel intervention technologies, and they are doing minimal processing. They do multiple hurdle approach where they combine different types of processes so that they can reduce the intensity of one type of a hurdle, thereby they are able to preserve the sensorial attributes and they can provide what the food industry wants. And when they go for this multiple hurdle approach, the, the, there is a lot of research that needs to be done. 
And uh, you know, control is really important because when you combine these technologies, you definitely want to produce safe food products. And you don't know when you combine things, is are we able to produce safe food? So research is definitely needed. And, and control is very, very important for uncooked food such as salads because there is no kill step to kill the bacteria. All we do is rely on washing, rely on the sanitization step, the minimal process, uh, to take care of any contamination that may be present in the salad vegetables. And uh, these days, we know that contamination can occur from various sources. 30 years ago, nobody thought that contamination ca can occur at the farm level, at the field level. And uh, we have been seeing a number of outbreaks that have been occurring from time to time, showing that contamination can occur at the field level. And these fields are, you know, vast. How are you going to be able to control all these, you know, contamination, all the various sources? And also, if we understand what are some of the survival strategies of the pathogens, we could come up with appropriate control measures to take care of all these contamination. And post-harvest processing is really important because we have understood that contamination can occur at the field level. And so post-harvest uh, control measures uh, have to be really solid so we can then prevent or reduce all these foodborne illness outbreaks. So research with regard to understanding the survival strategies, research with regard to coming up with appropriate control strategies is really important to prevent or to reduce foodborne illness outbreaks as well as recalls. And now I'm going to give you some examples of the research we have been doing with regard to survival strategies, cross-contamination, as well as control strategies. So we are going to be looking at what are some of the survival strategies of the foodborne bacteria from farm to fork conditions. So I'm going to be you know, talking about uh, various different aspects of survival strategies of bacteria. So the first one here is biofilm formation. So what are biofilms? Biofilms are basically layers of microorganisms, mineral deposits, nutrients that can be formed on a surface. And foodborne bacteria are forced to form biofilms under stressful conditions. For example, if there is uh, a scarcity of nutrients, bacteria may be uh, 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 forming biofilms. And uh, biofilms are very, very common, both in the pre-harvest as well as post-harvest uh, uh, food production, as well as processing environments. As long as you have a surface and as long as you, are, you have mineral deposits, nutrients, you, uh, bacteria can end up forming biofilms. And uh, they micro Organisms, they are they attach to each other, they attach to one another nutrients, mineral deposits by means of extracellular polymeric substances. It's also called as extracellular polysaccharides. These are sticky substances and the bacteria can attach to each other. And uh, in a food processing environment, if you take, there are hard to reach nooks and corners. And even though, you know, the, uh, the cleaning shift may come after 12 hours of production, they may be cleaning. There may be hard to reach areas where you can have these microorganisms surviving, nutrients, mineral deposits and bacteria, you know, can form biofilms easily. And uh, some of the advantages with regard to biofilms is that the top layer may, you know, may be, may be removed, but the bacteria that may be present in the innermost layers, they would be protected from the harsh, uh, you know, conditions of, you know, chemicals or sanitizers, and uh, they may still survive in there. And what can happen is when the top layer is being removed, these uh, foodborne pathogens, they can go and contaminate the food that has been further processed using that same equipment, and they can be a good source of cross contamination, and uh, they can end up have a form in, uh, uh, they can end up um, in, food, in uh, foodborne outbreaks. So biofilms are a big no-no when it comes to food production and processing environments. And in our lab, we are looking at using plant-based 
antimicrobials to prevent uh, the attachment and biofilm formation by various foodborne pathogens such as salmonella as well as listeria on uh, food processing uh, surfaces such as stainless steel and uh, various types of plastics. And we have been we have been able to show that some of the plant-based antimicrobials can definitely prevent attachment of these pathogens and uh, uh, subsequent biofilm formation. So if you can prevent attachment of these pathogens, then it might be even better because then you can prevent the formation of biofilms. The next survival strategy of foodborne pathogens is the viable but non-culturable state. So as the name implies, foodborne pathogens could be viable. But when you put them in common, you know, culture media, they will not be able to form colonies. And uh, so, you know, when people take food or irrigation water samples, uh, and if, you know, there is nothing growing, uh, then, you know, the industry might think that, okay, my product is clean, the irrigation water is clean. So if uh, viable but non-culturable cells are present in food products or in environmental matrices, uh, it could be really dangerous because they would give a sense of, you know, false negatives. And uh, B, B, and C cells, they are basically... Uh, metabolically less active, but they, they can still be infectious. And if the BBNC cells, let's say, are consumed via contaminated food or contaminated water, and they go into the human system, and uh, they can revert back to the normal state, and they can cause, uh, you know, infections. So they, the BBNC cells can still be dangerous. And uh, when do foodborne pathogens cause uh, BB, can uh, become BBNC? Then they are exposed to environmental stresses. They go into BBNC. And research has shown that Campylobacter jejuni, when they encounter, you know, cold conditions, for example, in cold water conditions, they can go into BBNC cells. And research in our lab has shown that foodborne pathogens such as E. coli 157H7, salmonella, as well as listeria, when you expose them to solar radiation, they can form BBNC cells. When you expose them to certain types of sanitizers, such as chlorination, they can form BBNC cells and they can revert back to the normal state under conditions of certain uh, stimuli. So it is really, really important to come up with strategies to prevent the BBNC formation and maybe even appropriate detection measures to detect these BBNC cells and maybe you know come up with some appropriate control measures. The next strategy is stress adaptation by foodborne pathogens. So foodborne pathogens, as you know, can encounter various types of stresses in food production and, uh, and processing environments. So one type of stress could be starvation stress because they don't have all the optimum nutrients required for their growth. Another condition could be an exposure to a chemical sanitizer, an exposure to an acid, oxidation stress. So there are diff different types of stresses these foodborne pathogens can uh, be exposed to. And they are able to sense these changes and they are able to respond appropriately. And research has shown that if foodborne pathogens are exposed to sublethal levels of stresses, for example, let's say a pH of 5.5, and then they are subsequently exposed to lethal conditions of the same stress or a different stress. So for example, I said pH 5.5, and then subsequently, let's say they are exposed to a pH of 4 or 3.5, they will be able to survive these lethal conditions of stress better in comparison to their non-adapted counterparts. So uh, research has shown that uh, pre-exposure to certain types of sublethal levels of stresses can cross-protect the uh, bacterial cells against other types of stresses as well. For example, Listeria monocytogenes that was, that was uh, exposed to sublethal levels of acid, heat, salt, as well as SDS, they improved the 
uh, ability of listeria to tolerate or to survive under unconjugated bile salts. So uh, uh, research has, you know, a lot of research has shown uh, stress adaptation ability of many of uh, the foodborne pathogenic agents. So we need to come up with appropriate control measures to take care of these stress adapted type of pathogens because now that we know that they survive better it is important to take care of all these stress adapted uh, type of you know foodborne pathogens now we are going to move on to cross contamination so as i told you 30 years ago we didn't think that and at the farm level, field level, we have to be really careful. Uh, but this particular slide shows um, uh, in the field conditions, what are some of the cross-contamination sources of field crops, specifically the edible portion of crops such as, you know, let's take salad vegetables. There are various different types of sources. And, you know, uh, we know that many of the growers, they make their own compost. So if you have, you know, untreated manure, you can have foodborne pathogens. And uh, uh, there are various insect type of vectors such as flies, they can carry pathogens and they can deposit uh, them onto the edible portion of the field crop. Uh, animal intrusion, you know, when I go to Yuma and when I talk to growers, they have uh, one of their, you know, one of their major, major concerns that they have told me is animal intrusion in their field conditions. So they have, you know, huge and huge acres of land where produce is grown in Yuma. And, uh, I, and it is very difficult to, you know, come up with fences or whatever. And at night, what happens is desert animals such as, you know, uh, coyotes and uh, javelinas and deers. Uh, depending on what part of the country you are in, they intrude the you know fields. They can defecate, and we all know that you know these carry uh, human enteric pathogens. And if there are fecal material and in the field conditions, and if there is you know wind blowing, they can carry these foodborne pathogens, and they can contaminate the edible portion of the crop. And then if the seeds are contaminated, yes, uh, they can end up. <laughs> contaminating the edible portion of the crop. I'll be talking to you about some of the research where we show that uh, contaminated seeds uh, can, you know, let uh, the pathogens internalize into the edible uh, tissue of the crop. And then irrigation water. Irrigation water has been implicated as the culprit in many, many different types of foodborne outbreaks that have occurred, you know, in the last 10, 20 years. Um, and then we also have other uh, types of microorganisms such as fungal organisms, nematodes, protozoans, they can act as vectors of foodborne pathogens and they can cross contaminate uh, uh, the edible portion of the crop. So now that we have seen that there are several sources of cross contamination at the field level, I'm going to give you some examples of research very, very briefly that we have done in our lab to show I know some of these agents of cross contamination. So the first one here is dust. Dust can be an, invis in an invisible source of cross contamination. And in the semi-arid as well as arid regions such as Arizona, we all know that there are a lot of dust storms. And um, research in our lab has shown that if you contaminate these, you know, dust particulate material, and if the dust is blowing, you can end up uh, contaminating the edible portion of the crop. We have shown that with both leafy greens as well as melons, even though, you know, the, the amount of contamination is low, you still have that risk where dust blowing can carry pathogens and you can you know, end up having uh, problems. And when I talk to growers, they have told me that in the summer, when you know when there is like a lot of these you know dust storms, dirt pebbles you know happening, then they do see some uh, positive salmonella hits in uh, either in their you know environmental, in, environmental matrices such as soils or in the plant tissue. So dust could be a source of contamination, and uh, it is going to be really difficult because how are you going to control these you know dust storms? It's not possible. So we probably have to have you know good. Uh, post-harvest uh, decontamination uh, measures. 
Then the next one here is contaminated seeds as well as uh, contaminated irrigation water. So I'm going to give you, you know, an example of the research we did in our lab. So what we did here was we used um, bioluminescent salmonella because we wanted to show contamination using uh, biophotonic imaging as well as uh, using confocal laser scanning, scanning microscopy. So we contaminated the seeds, uh, spinach seeds with the uh, uh, bioluminescent salmonella. Uh, in one scenario and in another scenario, we used healthy seeds, non-contaminated seeds, but then we contaminated uh, the irrigation water that was used for germinating these seeds. And we let the seeds uh, germinate in both scenarios. And we were able to show that salmonella persisted in the tissue. And not only that, it internalized into the various parts of the you know, uh, 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 of the germinated sprout, as well as uh, we were able to see the salmonella in the roots as well. And then what we did was we, when the contaminated irrigation water was used to uh, irrigate the, uh, the, the potted plant, and then the runoff was collected into a dish. And when we sampled that water runoff, we were able to recover salmonella from that water runoff, and we were able to uh, recover salmonella from the soil that was uh, you know, found in the you know, potted plant. And um, I'm just going to, you know, show you some of the pictures in here. And um, this is uh, basically biophotonic imaging of uh, the germinated uh, spinach sprout. This is the control, uh, no, you know, non-inoculated uh, sprout. And uh, this is uh, the uh, germinated sprout from one of the contaminated seed or irrigation water condition. And uh, as you can see in here, you can see red as well as uh, green and yellow. And the higher, uh, as you go up this, uh, 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 the color, uh, the higher the number of microorganisms. So you have the lower number of microorganisms. And as you increase in color, the highest uh, number of microorganisms using biophotonic imaging, we showed that there was contamination of salmonella in the germinated sprout. And we also showed contamination of salmonella in the root tissue as well as you can see in here. And then we took a section of the tissue and uh, using confocal scale, San scanning laser microscopy, we were able to show salmonella contamination and we were able to show that there was internalization uh, during, you know, after germination. So um, we definitely showed that, you know, uh, salmonella can persist and it can internalize. So it is very, very important to start with non-contaminated seed and uh, prevent, you know, contamination of the irrigation water. So that's at the <clears throat> pre harvest level. Now I'm going to move into consumer homes. So uh, there are various studies that have shown that consumers mishandle uh, and cause cross-contamination in their homes. And about 25% of the foodborne illnesses are caused because of cross-contamination in consumer homes. So uh, there are reports in the literature showing that uh, oftentimes, you know, consumers did just uh, drive up, they wipe their cutting board, and some of them were just washing the cutting board with water after cutting raw meat and poultry products before cutting their fresh produce or already to eat uh, vegetables. So we uh, did some uh, research in here. Uh, what we did was we contaminated uh, chicken breast uh, uh, with salmonella and uh, we researched three consumer handling scenarios in the lab. In the first scenario, what we did was uh, from the, the contaminated chicken was uh, cut five times with a knife on a cutting board. We did not do any washing whatsoever. And we used the same knife on the cutting board to cut uh, lettuce. In the second scenario, we, cu we cut the chicken. The knife and the cutting board were just rinsed in hot water, and then we cut uh, the produce. In the third scenario, what we did was we used the FDA recommended method of washing the knife and the cutting board with the uh, scrubbing with hot with uh, soft soap, and then rinsing uh, after mechanical scrubbing with hot water, and then we used the cutting board and knife to cut. Uh, 
produce. So uh, in both scenario one and two, we definitely saw cross contamination and the transfer rates of salmonella ranged anywhere from 0 0.0 to up to 75%. While in the case of scenario three, we showed that um, uh, we had uh, less than one log CFU per gram, which means there was no contamination. So we clearly showed that merely washing your utensils uh, with water is not enough. You have to mechanically scrub with soap and rinse it ho with hot water. And this can definitely help prevent cross contamination of ready to eat foods. So now I'm going to give you examples of some of the control measures, uh, uh, specifically with non-thermal processing. So the first uh, control measure we are going to talk about is high pressure processing. So, so high pressure processing is using pressures of a very, very high magnitude to treat, to treat food products. So imagine two elephants stepping on a small penny. That is the magnitude of pressure we are talking about. Anywhere between 200 to 700 megapascals of uh, pressure to treat uh, different types of food products. And uh, pressure is a very good alternative to heat because you can do the treatment at low temperatures of, you know, like you can go, you can do the pressure, you know, treatment at zero to up to, you know, 10, 12 uh, uh, degrees C. And the process is very environmentally friendly in comparison to heat because the pressure transmitting fluid uh, that can be used is water. And you can do a mixture of water and ethylene glycol. And this can be recycled several times and you you don't have to release it into the environment. So it's a very environmentally friendly process. And it's a much, much, you know, better process uh, compared to thermal processing because of the uniformity in, 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 in treatment. Pressure does not depend on uh, the size or the shape of the particulate material or the thickness of the particulate material. And pressure is instantaneous and uniform throughout the packaging material. So it is very, it happens immediately. The uniformity of the process is really good. And the, many of the food products that are treated with pressure have better sensory attributes. And uh, pressure uh, uh, is uh, very effective, not only against pathogenic bacteria, but also against spoilage microorganisms such as yeast and molds. And uh, pressure can not only improve the safety, but also the shelf life of different food products. So as I, as I told you, pressure is very effective from the surface to the interior. The uniformity of the process is really good. And uh, there are several products that are commercially treated using pressure and uh, they, you know, they have pretty good sensorial attributes. Examples of those would be juices, guacamole, salsas, avocados, prosciutto ham, ready to eat meat products. Pressure works really well. The only type of food products where pressure may not work really well is something that may have air pockets like guacamole, like uh, marshmallow, tomatoes, eggs. Maybe, you know, pressure may not work uh, really well, but uh, for all other types of food products, pressure will work really well. So here we treated <coughs> different types of unpasteurized raw juices, uh, with the pressure for one or two minutes. Um, and uh, we treated them at like 615 megapascals. And we were able to show that pressure worked really well against both E. coli as well as salmonella in grapefruit juice, orange juice, apple juice, as well as carrot juice. We got more than five blocks reduction in most cases, excepting uh, in case of apple juice with E. coli 15787, we got the most like, you know, close to a half a log reduction. But in all other juice, Uses for various salmonella serotypes as well as E. coli 015787. And these serotypes are, uh, uh, have been involved in outbreaks. Uh, pressure works really well. The next one is pulse electric field uh, processing. And this is again a non thermal type of processing where you use uh, pulse, we use, you use um, uh, very high intensity. Uh, pulses of a very high vol voltage, very, very short electric pulses of a very high voltage. And 
Some of the parameters include a, a, a field strength. You can do anywhere between 15 to 50 kilovolts per centimeter. You can use pulse width of two to 20 microseconds, and you can vary the pulse number. You can go up to 100 pulses, and uh, you can vary the treatment temperature. You don't want to go very high uh, treatment temperature because of the problems with arcing, but uh, you can do uh, you know treatment temperatures up to of up to 45 to you know 50 degrees C. So killing bacteria using electricity, very high voltage electricity and um, very short electric pulses. That's what we are doing in here. And pulse electric field processing is very useful for liquid type of food products so like water. Water is treated. Um, in Phoenix, there are companies that use uh, PEF PEF uh, to treat water. And uh, other types of food products that it can be useful would be fruit juices, uh, milk, and also liquid egg products. So any, you know, because we have flow through systems where, you know, you have these electrodes throughout uh, that would be treating the food product as the product flows through uh, a chamber and you can, you know, kill bacteria. And the mechanism of inactivation of uh, pulse electric field processing is by forming irreversible pores on the membrane of bacteria. Then the cell contents can leak out and uh, the cell ends up lysing and dying. And uh, pulse electric field processing is very effective against foodborne pathogens. And also it is very effective against uh, spoilage microorganisms. So you can have improvement in both safety as well as shelf life. And uh, if you combine PEF with other types of hurdles, you can improve the effectiveness of the technology. For example, if you add mild heat, and if you also make, uh, you know, uh, in, include low pH, as well as other types of antimicrobials, pulse electric field processing can be effective against the most resistant uh, forms uh, such as endospores. And that uh, pulse electric field processing in the food industry, it's very useful uh, to make uh, French fries. But so traditionally, French fry industry, what they were doing is they would immerse potatoes in hot water and they would leave it for like one hour. Um, and then they would, you know, do the slicing, whatever, to improve the texture of the food product. But what they've seen is research has shown that if you treat uh, potatoes with pulse electric field processing, you don't need to immerse, you know, in water for one hour. Uh, it, the, 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 uh, the technology can improve the texture of uh, the French fries and you can end up having really, you know, good texture product. So and the next uh, is uh, plant-based antimicrobial. So this is a very neat technology, which is uh, very effective in uh, uh, killing microorganisms, both uh, uh, pathogen cells as well as spoilage microorganisms. And we have done a lot of research uh, trying to come up with uh, uh, a good sanitizer that can be a replacement to chemical sanitizers for washing uh, produce. And uh, it's a clean label type of technology because um, it's all, you know, natural and food compatible. So we, uh, we you know, uh, it will be very welcome by the green consumers. And uh, there are certain advantages to using plant-based antimicrobials as opposed to uh, chemical sanitizers such as chlorine because uh, the uh, technology can be energy efficient. You can treat uh, 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 um, using cold water and it's a very environmentally friendly process because when you release the water in the environment, the, uh, the material is going to be biodegradable and the efficacy of uh, the plant-based antimicrobials is not affected in the presence of organic matter as opposed to chlorine. And um, uh, uh, chlorine can form carcinogenic compounds in reaction with organic matter. And we will not have you know, that kind of an environmental harm when you use plant-based antimicrobials because these are biodegradable. And then uh, the wash, wash water can be recycled several times uh, uh, because the efficacy is not uh, affected in the presence of organic matter. You just need to add very small quantities. And one of the major, major advantages of plant-based antimicrobial washes is that 
that you can have residual activity during storage, which would be very useful uh, during storage in the retail, during transportation, as well as consumer homes. So any surface contamination can be taken care of by this residual activity, and you will continue to see inactivation over a period of time. And not only that, many of the plant-based antimicrobials, they can enhance flavor. For example, oregano oil is added to salad dressings because it gives a good flavor to the product. And many of the plant-based antimicrobials have their own health benefits. Some of them can reduce blood sugar. Some of them can, can reduce cholesterol. And some of them have antioxidative activity, which means you can you know, reduce uh, uh, carcinogenic activity in many type of many different types of food products. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> this is a biophotonic imaging showing the effectiveness of plant-based antimicrobials uh, on the surface of lettuce. So uh, what, is, what we did was we contaminated the uh, lettuce leaf using a uh, bioluminescent uh, salmonella. And what you're seeing here is the bacterial population before the treatment and bacterial population after treatment, all the glowing is pretty much gone, showing that the, in all the organisms were inactivated using one of our agents. And uh, uh, this is again, you know, uh, show, uh, uh, the, this uh, 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 image also shows uh, a re reduction in the population of microorganisms, not completely, but to significant levels using another plant-based antimicrobial. So, and this table uh, shows the results for a plant extract as well as a plant-based essential oil on different varieties of cantaloupes. Cantaloupe has a rough surface and it's really difficult to inactivate microorganisms because they attach really well to the netting, the dense netting, and you, you cannot you know, inactivate these. But our plant-based antimicrobials have shown that uh, there is a reduction in the population immediately upon treatment and after storage, uh, for three days at refrigeration temperatures, we were able to show complete inactivation. No survivors were detected in many of the varieties as well as hybrids of cantaloupe. So to summarize, uh, so far what we have been, what we have seen uh, from the various discussions, we saw that foodborne pathogens are able to survive in the food production environments, and some of the strategies are forming biofilms, uh, going into the viable but non-culturable state, and stress adaptation. We also saw that various environmental matrices can be a source of cross-contamination at the field level, and examples of uh, research I have shown uh, to you include uh, dust, uh, so, uh, contaminated soil, contaminated irrigation water, and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, I gave you an example of a research where I showed that the contamination of produce uh, during germination, either via contaminated seed or via contaminated irrigation water, can cause foodborne pathogen to persist and to internalize into the tissue and be reintroduced into the irrigation water or into the soil where it can go back and cross contaminate you know, other uh, produce crops. Then uh, I also showed you that the FDA recommended washing method of mechanical scrubbing with soap as well as washing them in hot water uh, uh, will be very effective for kitchen tools. And then we also saw some of the non-thermal control uh, technologies are effective treatment for certain types of food products. Uh, high pressure processing is very effective for juices, ready to eat meats, guacamole, jams, jellies, uh, and preserves, uh, and so on. And we also saw that pulse electric field processing is a good uh, technology for making fluid type of food such as fruit juices, uh, milk, as well as you know, water uh, safer, and also to improve the shelf life of these food products. And we finally saw that plant-based antimicrobials uh, are very effective uh, wash sanitizers for fresh produce. So some general conclusions from what we have seen so far, we saw that, you know, foodborne outbreaks continue to occur and foodborne pathogens keep, keep emerging from time to time. And uh, the current consumers, <clears throat> they want uh, 
of foods with good sensorial attributes, good nutritional quality. At the same time, they want safe food products and the food industry is gearing towards minimal processing or a multiple hurdle approach, combining technologies at lower intensities to meet the consumer preference to produce foods with the good sensorial attributes at the same time, safe food products. We saw that bacteria have survival strategies uh, that uh, definitely need to overcome by appropriate control measures and research is definitely needed in this particular area. And we saw that uh, better food processing technologies at the post-harvest level are needed because we have seen that cross-contamination can occur at the pre-harvest level. And then finally, consumers should follow precautions to minimize cross-contamination in their kitchen and they need to follow FDA recommended uh, practice of washing kitchen utensils. So finally, uh, before I finish, I would like to uh, thank uh, my lab group, my lab manager, my postdocs, uh, research technicians, graduate students, undergraduate students, and the Yuma lab group uh, for doing all the work. Without their hard work, I would not have been able to discuss any of this research with you. I would like to thank all my collaborators uh, for their support and for their discussion in uh, doing the research. Uh, and uh, I would also like to thank all the funding agencies. Without the financial support, we would not have been able to do any of the work. Um, and finally, I would like to thank uh, you, the audience, for listening to me for the last one hour, uh, listening patiently. I know I went over a lot of different uh, uh, topics uh, when it came when it comes to food safety. So thank you for listening, and again, thank you, the organizers, uh, Shaina, for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, discuss uh, my research with you. I will be happy to take uh, any questions. Um, um, so thank you again. I don't know if I have time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi Shankar. Um, I'm sure, you know, we can let people go to lunch if they want, but also if they have questions, I think we can stick around and get those answered if they, if they want to stick around. Okay, okay. So let me look through here to see um, what we've got here. <clears throat> Great presentation with all the <clears throat> various pathogen reduction technologies. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. I don't see any questions uh, in here. Um, yeah, I don't see any questions so far. So if you know if anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that great presentation. And I like, you know, stuff looking towards the future, especially with those new technologies, with, you know, sanitizers, the plant-based stuff. That is really cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah, there is one that I yeah, questions are coming now, so I'll go ahead and answer them. I know people probably are hungry. <laughs> you know, I'm in the way of their lunch, but I'll try to, you know, go ahead. Yeah. So Jennifer, um, have you done any research on farming areas that are adjacent to cattle? Is there any correlation to <clears throat> waste polluting groundwater used for irrigation? So um we have not done any research in the farming areas that are adjacent to cattle, but uh, we have done research looking at um, the survival of um, foodborne pathogens in you know, animal fecal material. And I can definitely tell you that uh, among the pathogens, salmonella seemed to survive the most. We did sampling for up to 365 days and salmonella kept going um, e. coli, you know, the population reduced, um, but salmonella definitely kept going. And, you know, another research we have done when it comes to farming conditions is um, uh, birds. And we were able to show that some of the migratory birds, we might want to be careful about. The small birds that are present in the growing regions do not pose a huge risk, but some of the, you know, migratory birds may be carrying salmonella. And uh, you know that we may need to watch for any correlation to waste polluting groundwater used for irrigation. 
Um, I do not have any research in that particular area, um, Jennifer. Sorry. Um, Clark Furlong, uh, what are some examples of plant-based antimicrobials? Yeah, great question. Plant-based antimicrobials include um, things like, you know, plant extracts, uh, spices, plant powders, plant essential oils, and active components of essential oils. And some examples I can give you is uh, we have used um, uh, apple extracts, grape seed extracts, grape pomace extracts, and these are usually made from uh, the industrial waste byproducts. We have olive extract, olive juice extract, olive leaf extract that we have tested in our lab. Examples of essential oils would be oregano oil, cinnamon oil, lemongrass oil, and their active components such as um, cinnamaldehyde, um, carbacrol, as well as uh, citrol. And these are very, very potent uh, uh, <coughs> antimicrobials that have a very, very uh, <coughs> strong antimicrobial activity. Um, and I didn't go over some of the other research, but uh, something as simple as uh, onion powder, if you add them to grilled meats, you can um, end up having uh, a reduction in carcin the formation of carcinogenic compounds in grilled meats uh, by just adding some of these, you know, plant extracts, plant powders, essential oils, and, uh, you know, onion powder, up to 94% reduction. And some of the uh, plant extracts like olive extracts and essential oils like clover the oil uh, can not only kill the E. coli bacteria, but they can reduce the formation of potentially carcinogenic compounds such as uh, heterocyclic amines in grilled meat products. We showed like complete reduction of E. coli and more than 80% reduction in the formation of uh, heterocyclic uh, amine type of you know, carcinogenic products. Yeah, I think those are the questions I see. Um, I know, you know, I don't want to take away a time from lunch, but you know, but I'm I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions. Yeah, thank you so much. That was seriously thank so you. so cool. <laughs> um, and then yeah, so we will meet back here and start at one. So we have like about forty five minutes for lunch. And the attendance survey has been posted again in the chat. So um, just fill it out once today and then we will have your attendance counted. All right, we'll see you guys back at one o'clock. <laughs>